Hi, I'm Bill McMurdo and this is Revival Scotland. I want to continue on a theme that I started uh, in a message recently to say that I was going to do this and so I'm being true to my word, that we're going to be looking at Scotland's need for fathering leaders. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture in Isaiah chapter 22 where a man called Shebna or Shebna was the king's chamberlain. He was the right hand man of the king. We would call him perhaps today a prime minister. And Shebna was to be replaced by Eliakim. And that's a theme I speak about quite a bit uh, in my ministry. Uh, this particular passage I refer to it quite a bit. So let's just read some scripture and then see what God has to say um, about fathering leaders. And Scotland's great need for leaders of a fathering heart right now. Okay, so let's just read some things. It says here, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go get thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house. Now, th that word treasurer is used, I believe, we would maybe say a mercenary or a bean counter, someone who's, who's um, counting up how he can profit from his office. And we see that today with politicians and political and national leaders, that very often they'll serve a stint in national service as, as leaders, and then they'll go off and make millions on the speaking circuit and so on. And it gets to the stage where you do begin to wonder, are these uh, career politicians really using politics as a stepping stone to coining it in, to kerching time, to cashing in on their fame and their office? And Shebna in the Bible was a man like that. And it says, go to him. Um, and, and it's interesting, it says, thus said the Lord uh, God of hosts, which is speaking about the, the, the commander of heaven's armies. In other words, this is God speaking formally. This is God speaking in his position as commander of angelic hosts. And it says, say to him, What hast thou here, and whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulchre here, as he that hath hewn him out a sepulchre on high? See, what happened with Shebna was, he commissioned um, the grave, or a grave, that was on a level that kings were buried in. It was it was a very expensive, very lavish, very uh, opulent, in a sense, uh, tomb, uh, which was a message he was sending out to people that he was an important person, that he was on the level of kings. Now, you know, we are kings and priests as believers unto God, um, but we, we don't have to um, advertise that in a way that is supposed to impress people. Shebna was obviously a man who was very prideful, he had uh, very high self-esteem, uh, and by that I mean the wrong kind of self-esteem, in that he saw himself as an important man and wanted others to think of him like that. In other words, he was a self-seeker, self-server, and self-promoter. And, uh, and it's interesting, a little plain words here that it's used, because it says here, and he, that graveth a habitation for himself in a rock. What the Lord was saying was, this is a ministry of death. This is a man whose office equals death. He's ministering death. He's not ministering life. If you're a minister of God, um, then you have to minister life, not death. And Shebna was, of course, a political animal. He was a, a leader in the, the civic sphere of things. Uh, but in a sense, being the king's chamberlain, particularly of the house of David, it was a very sacred position uh, and, and, and a, a position of great honour and prestige but a position that required a man to be somebody who was sold out to God, to be a, to be a holy uh, and, and set apart man for the purposes of God in serving uh, the throne of the Lord on the earth. Remember that that was uh, how it was labelled in the Old Testament, that the throne of David was the throne of the Lord. And so the throne of David is God's representative seat of authority on the earth. So we don't need somebody who is the right-hand man of, of the one who sits on the throne, a very important position, a chamberlain, a prime minister, a, a high-ranking figure. We don't need somebody like that who's just a self-seeker. So the Lord, through the prophet Isaiah, addresses this man and says, Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, will surely cover thee, will surely violently turn and toss you like a ball into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house, and I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. What's all this message about? Let me just get straight into it. I believe the Lord is saying that we've had the wrong kind of leaders. 
And I'm talking about national leaders, I'm talking about political leaders. We may have even had that in the church, and that's a, a tough thing to say, but you know, whatever that's going on right now, we really don't need to be messing around anymore and playing church games. And a lot of people are in ministry for the comfort of it, for the prestige of it. <clears throat> Let me just say this. If in any leadership position, if you're in it for the wrong reasons, then you need you need to consider yourself. Because God has a template, God has a standard, God has a bar that he has set for the right kind of leadership. Scotland needs the right kind of leaders. And this ought to be a message to every polit politician, political leader, um, and every uh, civic leader, and also even church leaders. If your motivation, if your heart isn't right in your leadership position, God wants you either out of the picture or he wants you to have a massive change of heart and repentance. I don't care if you're the first minister. I don't care if you're someone who just is a, is a local community council leader. God needs leadership that is patterned after him and his word. Scotland needs that. This is a message, if you like, for Scotland, that Scotland has to have fathers and leaders. Now, let me just continue. He says, I'm going to take all this stuff from you, uh, Sheb. And then he says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, which means God will raise up the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand. God says, I'm taking the authority and government that you have and putting it into the hands of someone who is worthy of it. Who, who can carry that mantle because their heart is right. My prayer very often when I'm praying for government leaders is that God will remove the wicked and replace them with the godly. If you're a leader in government and you're watching this, I'm praying about you. And if you're not the right sort, then I'm praying you out. It's as simple as that. And every believer that hears this message, every remnant believer is doing the same thing because we don't need self-seekers, self-promoters, self-servers, selfish um, people who are just trying to feather their own nest like Shebna, try to look important, try to be important. We need people who have the right heart. And so you either change your heart or we pray you out. It's as simple as that. I'm being direct about it. And friends, if you're watching this and, and you're hearing this um, and, and you want to know how to pray about leaders, pray that God will remove the Shebnas of this world and replace them with the Eliakims. Because we need leaders with a father and heart. Look what it says. Look what it says here. It says this. It says, um, I will come to pass that day, I'll call my servant Eliakim, uh, clothe him with thy robe, strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand. He shall be a father. He shall be a father. He shall be a father. He will have a father in heart. He will have father in leadership. He will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of David. We would say this, that we need father and leaders in our parliaments in this nation. I'm talking about Scotland, I'm talking about Britain. We need fathering leaders who will be a father to the people and also a father to the nation, to the house of Judah. And I, I remember a long time ago, the Lord speaking to me about that, about being a father, the father to the nation. It's so important. If you're watching this, and I'm not talking here about a gender, you know, mothers, sorry, wives, eh, women. <laughs> women can be father and leaders too, do you understand? The fathers, mothers. I said that in a recent uh, message too. Uh, that's what we need. And so we're going to have to change our way of thinking from being accepting of people who push themselves forward to lead uh, and, and, and promote themselves. You know, you could actually say that the number one reason for disqualifying uh, somebody for the office of, say, Prime Minister, is that they want it. Uh, they want it, in, in other words, for the wrong reasons, for selfish reasons, for self-promoting reasons. Uh, these positions in offices, the, the leadership is for people who feel the sense of calling to service, serve others, or, of duty, um, not for people who who look who see it as well. Everybody will think I'm wonderful, and what a chance to shine 
and show everybody how, how tremendous I am. Uh, and we get too many leaders like that. We need a fathering uh, paradigm, a paradigm of fathering leadership in Scotland today. And so he said that you'll be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. The key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. We can tie this in with uh, Revelation chapter 3, the, the, the only other mention of the, the key of David uh, is, is in Scripture, the, the explicit mention that is. And of course the Philadelphia church is associated with the key of David, the church of the open door. And it says the government is upon his shoulders, uh, about Jesus, and it says here that he will commit the government in his hand. The key of the house of David will be laid upon Eliakim's shoulder. We need people who will take the key of the house of David upon their shoulder. I preach a lot about the house of David. I've written uh, two books about it and other uh, things that I write are in reference to it. It's a big part of my teaching. big part of my ministry is teaching on the house of, uh, sorry, the key of David. And indeed, the blessing of Abraham. The key of David, um, and they believed that, scholars believed that that key was a, a literal key that was worn um, upon the shoulder, upon the, a sash or, or, or upon you know, something here. That there was a literal key that they would have upon the shoulder of the chamberlain. And that key was either a symbolic key and that everybody that saw that person would know that he was the one with the key to, the, to all of the king's palace and all of the kings. If he was the man, the right-hand man of the king. If you've watched Game of Thrones, you'll, you'll understand that they had that uh, the person who was called the hand and they had a little brooch with the hand uh, on their uh, uh, lapel here. And they would uh, that would be the king's right-hand man, the hand of the king. Well, this is a similar thing, the key... Uh, and it was a, it was a, some scholars think it might have been just a ceremonial key, but others believe it was a literal key in that it was a master key to all of the doors in the palace. You know, if you had responsibility, say, for the kitchens in the palace, then you would have the key to the kitchens, but you wouldn't have the key to the uh, other parts or other rooms of the, the king's uh, palace or house, but the chamberlain would. He would have the master key. And I remember preaching this message. Uh, in a church in Musselburgh and somebody came up to me at the end and said I I've got a master key for uh, for my work where he worked he was given the master key by the previous uh, supervisor who had left and he had the master key to all the doors and it was actually a, a famous uh, a museum in Edinburgh and he had he, he worked there and that was his he had the master key so the master key is something that the Chamberlain would have God has given you and I the master key to this nation God has given you the master key to revival. God has given you and I the master key to awakening, to outpouring, to seeing the move of God in Scotland, to bringing Scotland back to how it should be, the people of the book. And remember Knox and Calvin, these were men who uh, understood uh, nation taking and city taking. And uh, we need to see that return. We need people who will be... And, and the reason I mention Calvin and Knox is very simple. I've been teaching this in Bible college recently about Calvin and Knox. They were apostles with a father and heart, and they became, particularly Knox, became father to the nation of Scotland. He was the father to the nation, father of the nation. John Knox, an apostolic leadership, apostolic father in leadership that went beyond just reforming the church and became a transformation in the nation, that redeemed culture, redeemed society, and brought the whole nation into God's kingdom and stamped, kicked the kingdom upon uh, Scotland. And of course, Scotland was under the uh, cultural uh, dominion in a lot of ways of Calvinism. And of course, Knox and Calvin were together in Geneva for a while. And um, it's interesting because apparently Calvin thought that Knox was even more of an extremist reformer than he was. Uh, but the two men had this um, time together and Calvinism became the culture of Scotland. You see, we're not about just getting a few folks saved or having a wee revival and a happy clappy meeting here and there. We're about transforming society 
through the redemption of culture and bringing in a culture of God's kingdom into the earth. And it lasted a good few hundred years, 500 years in Scotland, Calvinism. But we, we need to see another reformation. And that reformation has to come through men like Calvin and Knox. Uh, and, and these men uh, who brought not just a gospel message, got a few folks saved, or even many people saved, but transformed the way that the, the entire nation uh, comported itself. So these are important matters. These are things that we need to, and we need to be praying into this, folks. We need God to raise up fathering leaders in Scotland. You might be one of them. Uh, so if you ask God to send out uh, labourers into the harvest, always be ready to answer that prayer yourself because he'll send you. And if you ask God to raise up fathering leaders or fathers and mothers in Israel, he'll send you. Very, very likely. But one thing's for sure, we need God to answer our prayers, that he'll raise up fathers of the nation, fathers to the nation, fathers in the nation. I'm talking about spiritual fathers here. I'm not talking about you going off and having 20 kids. I'm talking about you going off and having thousands of uh, sons and daughters in the gospel and transforming Scotland by redeeming culture and changing society back to a kingdom-centric um, basis and paradigm. We must enter into this coming out of this um, coronavirus nonsense. And it is nonsense. A lot of it is nonsense. Um, because there are so many things that have been taught about this and being said about this. And mature saints, mature sons and daughters, who are being matured into being fathers themselves and mothers themselves, they need to be taking dominion at this time. You need to be taking dominion uh, in your private prayer time and saying, Father, here am I, send me. But Lord, raise up men and women who will be fathers and mothers to Scotland and to this nation of Britain. The Lord bless you, folks.